Hey everybody, welcome to the next episode of the Strand Tennis Center podcast, filled with tips, advice, tennis, not tennis, just life advice too, whatever you need. Uh, like it on YouTube, share it on uh, the podcast as well. Thank you. All right, George, welcome to the Strand Tennis Center podcast, everybody. I am your host, Steve Capo. George is here. It is, you're not supposed to name these dates, but who cares, George? It's Friday. What is it? July, late July 26th. I'm um, going to go over a few things today in regards to, uh, I'm usually always reading, George, so, and I go through my list of uh, what I've been reading and going, and what I'm feeling and saying, all right, maybe I should go over this because it's really important. Uh, uh, it, it, basically, it's about adversity. Adversity is your friend. That's basically the title of the podcast to me, and I think people don't like adversity, but really, it really is the difference between you and... Uh, really being successful or not. So I'm going to go over Les Schwab's book, which is an incredible book. It's called Pride and Performance. Les Schwab had a tire company out in the Northwest, which was very successful. But I'm going to read a little bit about his bio. Uh, It's just incredible. So he was born in Oregon. His family moved to Minnesota two years later when he was young. Then in 29, they moved back to Oregon, where Schwab was schooled in a railroad boxcar. That's where he was schooled. This boxcar schoolhouse was a lodging camp in central Oregon. At 16, Schwab became an orphan. At 15, excuse me, became an orphan and began delivering the Oregon General Newspaper, Journal Newspaper. Started working in the newspaper at 15 years old. Now, this is another thing. He had to sell the newspaper. went door-to-door selling papers as well and had a route and all that stuff. But if you can learn how to sell, you can be successful no matter what you do. Selling is key. That's just a side note, and that'll be uh, something we'll discuss later. At the paper, he would eventually cover all the routes in Bent, Oregon, nine in all. He then completed the high school education, graduating from Bent High School. After high school, he married his high school sweetheart. And usually what I find that these successful guys, in in a weird sort of way, they find the person they're going to be with, and they kind of check that box. And they're with that person so they can focus on all these things that they're really focused on. They find a solid person that... And they, and they do it early. You know, you'll see a lot of people get divorced, but mostly a lot of the most successful people I find that they find this person early, they check that box, and they're like, let's get going to what is in, not what is important, but what really is the major goal is to kind of create a life. Uh, so he met his high school sweetheart, married her, Dorothy, before becoming a circulation manager in the newspaper. He then served in the Army Air Corps during World War II. So this guy was an orphan. He's at 15 starting to work, paid for his education. I, I, I mean, didn't pay for his high school education, but paid his way, took care of all these people. Les Schwab's venture into the tire business began with him buying this rubber, uh, OK rubber, in, in 62, in, in 52. And when you go through this, if you go through this book, there is a ton of roadblocks. He can't buy this. He can't do that. He can't get the money for this. He can't, you figure out what to do. It's amazing. Previously, Les had never fixed a flat tire before. He borrowed 11000 from a relative, sold his house, and borrowed from his life insurance policy and purchased a small shack that did not even have running water or a bathroom. So think about that. You're 15. You have a job at a newspaper. You're like, okay, I'm an orphan. And he still is going to take a risk and go, all right, I'm going to buy this tire place. I've never changed a tire, but I see the opportunity. I'm going to borrow $11,000. I'm going to borrow off my house. I'm going, to, I'm going to sell my house. Sorry. I'm going to borrow off my life insurance and purchase this thing. Think about that. That's called burning the ships. From this, he grew, he grew this into a billion-dollar empire based in Oregon. It has 410 stores, 1.6 billion annual sales. This is back in 2007. He passed away 2008, 2009. So it's probably, and it was just sold recently. It's amazing how these leaders start things. And then he said, I'll never sell it. And then the family ended up selling it probably 10, 15 years later. It was unfortunate because both his son and his daughter died before him. His son died in a car accident in the 70s. And his daughter died of cancer before in like 2004, 2005. So... They eventually sold this thing. But the, the key to this is these fundamentals that I'm going to go over with him and how he developed this tire company from nothing 
to billion dollar industry because what he did was it was very inclusive his profit sharing plan was innovative he gave a lot of things away he gave percentages of, the, of each store away which motivated people right so there's a simple thing that I'm going to read here that he wrote in his book which is an incredible book you should read it it's very important it's about people businesses relationships being successful on the tennis court, being a great coach, being a great student is about people, how you relate to them, how you work with them. So he goes, how do you make people feel important? The best way is to believe that they are important, which is a really simple thing, but most people don't think people are important. Really believe it, really want to make each man under you successful and you've got to believe it in your heart. So if you really believe that you want your student on the court to be successful or you want your, your relationship to be successful, you've really, really got to believe it in your heart that you're going to do this. You've got to want to make everyone below you successful. Even if you're working as a manager of a boss above you, you want everyone to feel successful. You'll find yourself showing it in, in many ways. So this is what you'll do. He says... By giving them all responsibility and authority they can handle. So people hate to be micromanaged. They hate to be told, this is how you have to do it. This is what you have to do. Give them responsibility and give them authority. Let them make their decisions and base it on the results at the end of a quarter or end of a, a year and say, okay, this is where we're at. These are the numbers or not. There's nothing worse than micromanaging somebody. Andrew Wilkinson had a great book called Never Enough that he just put out. And he said he he runs a company called Tiny that owns businesses. And one of his CEOs was like, I want to try this great idea. And he said it, what, he, he thought it was a terrible idea. But the problem is, is when you tell someone no and then they're not successful, it's your fault. So he said we burnt a million dollars just to let this guy do what he wanted and then come back and say, okay, this wasn't the right decision. So even if it costs you money, you've got to let somebody have the responsibility. Obviously, short of going out of business, you want to do that. But if somebody wants to make a, take it smaller instead of these big numbers, somebody wants to do something for 500 bucks and you don't think it's a good idea, you might as well let them do it because you don't want to feel like you're saying no to them. Let them make it. If, they, if it doesn't work, it's on them. You want to include them in what's going on. So there's nothing worse than when orders come from above and no one's listening to anybody. You want to be able to listen. It's the same thing like being a coach. If you lay down a bunch of orders and don't really listen to your team, you're going to have you're going to have trouble. You got to listen to your team and see what they're good at and not good at. Don't just kind of not include them in these big decisions. So you got to include people in what's going on. So they're part of the process. Assign them work which is important in their eyes, work they can take pride in. Don't just give people busy work. That just sucks. Don't just, when you run a tennis clinic, when you run a tennis lesson, when you run a private lesson, don't just do it for form's sake and just keep bu people busy. Realize what they need, what's important. Say, okay, if, if somebody needs to work on something and you're just going to go through the process of your lesson again, they need something in particular and they need to be ready, you're just not listening you're not assigning them stuff that's important to them. That goes so well on the court. You have to have to realize what somebody needs. Uh, let, uh, there's, another, there's another great one. Letting him share him or her the limelight now and then with you. So there's nothing worse when a coach or, a, or an owner or CEO takes all the credit for all the work. That's the worst kind of leader you want. When a coach, you'll see it, when a coach is successful or their player wins, they give it all to the players. They say the team sacrificed, they did this and this. You think all of these things seem pretty obvious, but they're really hard for people to understand. You People have egos, and they want to take the credit for everything. You know, we, we are running a business here, George, and everybody here is the one, is the reason why. People on the court teaching. Me just talking is not part of it. It's hopefully providing the leadership that can make people successful, but they have to do the job and do the work and get up in the morning and be here for hours on end. So it's them making the play successful. Um, you can have a vision, but if you don't 
make them part of the process, make them feel important. It's useless. So you have to do that with, with tennis too. You can't just, you know, sometimes you can disagree with your student, but you have to tell them the reasoning why and say, listen, I think this is important and I think it's going to help you in the end. You got to make them part of the process. Take a sincere interest in the individual. So when you're a coach, coaches have the most success in players on the highest level when they know that the coach really cares for them as a person. Because when you get to the highest level of play, whether it be Alcarez or people top 10, top 20 in the world, the level of play is not the difference that a coach makes. It's not them tweaking your forehand as much as them believing in your voice and trusting that you care for them as an individual in their best interest and you'll do everything for them. Works in business, works on the court. If you do not care for the people that are working for you, they're not going to care for you. And the second they get a better opportunity, they're going to take it. By asking for and listening to his or her advice. So listening is so important. You know, people say that it's an open forum and, you know, everybody's opinion is important. And I, I've said this story before. A large company came to Steve Jobs, Apple, I forget what it was, and a billion dollar company as well. So we want to do what you guys do. We want to be successful. How do you stay innovative and be this big company? Well, he says we listen to everybody. And if at the end of a project, we're almost done with it, somebody has a, an idea that actually is better than the one we're doing, we're going to scrap the whole idea. And he goes, well, we can't do that. He goes, well, then you can't be us. So in other words, you have to be willing to say, okay, you know what? We spent six months on this. This is crap. You guys are right. We're not going to do this. You have to listen to the voices and you have to really, really be able to say, okay, this advice is of value and I'm going to take it. It's very important. Business coaching at all. If you're going to coach somebody, you have to listen. It's the best way. I mean, it seems so simple, but we don't listen. We're all waiting for our chance to speak and we don't want to do that. By, uh, let's see, being confident in them once in a while. Be, oh, be Sorry, confident. Be confiding in them once in a while. So you have to confide in them as well. Like, there should be a little bit of a separation, but once in a while you have to be straight and be honest with the people you're dealing with. As a coach, you can show vulnerability. As a boss, you can show vulnerability. It makes you human. Yes, you confide in them and tell them something that, that, can, that connection will help you Help them feel closer to you. On a coach, on, in a business, you need to confide in uh, your player or your employee. And there's one more which is fantastic here. Where is he? Where is it? Where is the one more? I got it right here. By letting them know they are needed and appreciated, relationships, anything, you have to let them know that they're important. And again, I've said this a thousand times, one-on-one -on -one meetings with employees or anybody for... Once every month, once every two months, just to say they're doing a great job and they're important is very, very huge. People need to feel appreciated. You can't just have them work when there's no end to it and it's just constant, 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 constant without any type of reward. Some people don't, you know, everybody's currency is different. Some people just don't want the money. They want to feel like you're doing it, that they're appreciated and you say thank you to them. There's nothing wrong with saying thank you. So... Since Georgie's here, I'm going to go over the poor George story. It's great. George, this is a great one. Les Schwab had a great story. This is a part of customer service. This is the same thing about success and adversity. It's all it's all rolled into one, but it's part of the book, so I wanted to mention it. It's a great story I tell the employees, and I tell, I tell everybody. So he's running a small business, right? He's not, you know, uh, he's not Firestone yet or all that stuff, and he's saying, so he runs all these small all these small st tire shops and he gives a percentage of the business to each manager and the manager's like oh we gotta cut the price we should do this we should do that he goes look I got a t story for it it's a fictional story about poor George this guy George runs a little small little shop the buddy comes in he goes yeah can you change and rotate my tires blah 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 and can you do it for this price he lowers the price he says you know what I can't pay you right away you know I'll pay you in six months and the guy George says okay no problem blah 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 and then three months, six months, eight months later, the guy didn't pay him on time. And, you know, but that guy, George, is so nice. And then a year later, George goes out of business and the guy goes, oh, I guess I got to go to uh, Firestone. So he goes there and they make him pay full price. They make him pay right there. No credit on time because he goes, all right, that's a real company. I got to respect them because but I really miss that George guy. He was a nice guy. Well, that's the whole damn point. 
you can't let the customers run your business. They miss George, yeah, because they were fucking taking advantage of him the whole damn time. So that's the whole point. There's a fine line here. You can't have your customer or your or your player run the practice or your customer run your business because what happens is you go out of business. So that's just what happens. These small businesses get in, in a, a really tough situation. They say yes to everything because they think, Everybody thinks it's a family, and all of a sudden the business goes out, and they're like, oh, boy, I really missed that little small coffee shop. They were great. Well, Jesus, you kept nickel and diamond the whole time. You didn't pay them. They need the money. So it's a great story to say, look, your player doesn't run your practice. Your customers don't run your business. You want to give them as much as you can, but you also have to stay in business. And I've said this several times before. The perfect example of a business is you have a great value. You have this great thing you want to give to someone. We can help someone improve. Fitness-wise, mentally-wise, on the court, tennis, it's going to be the best part of their day. But for us to do that, we have to make money. So the money enables us to make us the best part of your day. So in anywhere in that value chain, if that's messed up, we are losing money each lesson, we can't provide that. So that's the simplest best way capitalism works you provide great value and you make money as a byproduct of it but if you become poor george and you just yes everybody to death and you say don't pay me for a year you're going to go out of business you have to be really careful and Les was great at that he was great with people they used to do a flat tire system they used to change flat tires for free it wasn't what didn't mean he wasn't a customer service person they would change tires anywhere on the road for you and they would change them for free it was amazing people were part of the uh, part of the les schwab uh, community so hopefully this gives you a little insight on number one adversity adversity is huge you don't need to come from upper echelon you don't need to come from a place where you've got everything handed to you you don't even need to come from middle class place i mean lesh was 15 years old he was an orphan and uh he became the owner of a billion dollar business so if you're feeling in a situation where everybody's got more than you, and especially in this area, you can look around and you can feel very, very like, oh, they've got this house, they've got a beach house, they're here, they're away here. Listen, the less you have, the better. Remember, too, too little no good, too much no good. I would say somewhere on the end of less would be better instead of on the end of more. But I hopefully this helps. And uh, George... If you remember the poor George story, buddy, you're running a business too, being a videographer. Don't give them deals, George. They don't deserve it. <laughs> Everybody have a great day. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Hope you like the podcast. Please share it with your friends, anybody that you know, anybody that's into tennis, anybody that's into bettering themselves, share it.